to RoboJackets TE Sessions week five. I think that's how math works. Um, but yeah, I'm Sarah Tor. I'm the Outreach Education Lead, so this is my thing. This is John Fogarty. He's from Make and Magic, FRT Team 1102. Uh, so I'm really glad you guys are here. You're going to learn effective usage of cops and FRTs. So yeah, enjoy. Yeah. Snaps for John. <laughs> so hello, everybody. Um, as Sarah just said, my name is John Fogarty. I'm actually the head coach of FRC Team 1102. Most of you guys' first introduction to who we were was this past year. Uh, uh, and I'm also a software engineer. I've been working uh, doing software development for three years now for uh, now a company called Rural Sourcing, which we have an office here in Atlanta. So if you are ever interested in software engineering, Rural Sourcing is a really cool place to start out and they offer jobs for students right out of college uh, as a great way to um, get your feet wet in terms of software engineering. All right. Um, so yeah, that's who I am, for those of you who walked in the door. Uh, so I started out doing robotics a really long time ago. Uh, I joined an FLL team in 2005 when I was a sixth grader in middle school. Uh, funnily enough, that was the same family of teams that I ended up joining in high school with Team 1102, uh, and I got to participate in the original First Tech Challenge, which was still VEX, and then they upgraded to the LEGO system, which doesn't exist anymore either in First, uh, at least First Tech Challenge. <coughs> um, and then uh, I graduated high school in 2012. Uh, I attended the University of South Carolina uh, for computer engineering. Uh, and then while I was there, I started an FRC team 4901, which uh, ended up downgrading to an FTC team just because it made more sense financially. Uh, and then I've mentored a couple teams. One was another Georgia team uh, up in Appling, uh, 5632 back in 2016. Uh, mentored a Brazilian team, 1772, in software development uh, in 2013. and then. Uh, Another team from Columbia in 1293, and now I'm back home with 1102 again. Uh, this past year was my first year as coach of that team, so a lot of things changed very rapidly for them compared to how they were before. Um, so I like to start things off with quotes. If you've watched any presentations from Karthik, you know he does the exact same thing. Uh, some of the best designs don't start with a blank piece of paper. You can use things that others have made before you and come up with ways to make them work even better. Woody Flowers said that, and I'm sure he wasn't the first person to say it, but he was the first person I heard say it. And I take this really deeply into heart about my philosophy on design. I'm not a mechanical engineer. I'm not the best person to teach you about the physics of one thing versus another, but I have a fairly strong grasp on like efficiency and uh, design strategies that have been effective over the course of competitive robotics. So I'm going to start things off with a question, and who knows the answer. What is our most important resource during the build season? Congratulations, right off the bat, you got it. Here's another quote. How did it get so late so soon? <laughs> Somebody on your team has asked that question to themselves at least once during build season, I guarantee it. So this is just a first start off about what I think teams should consider as like an ideal form of a schedule, though it varies year to year based on what uh, the challenge is and how simple or complex the challenge is for the game. So right now, your team should be preparing and pre-ordering and uh, getting the components that you need in stock now. Because if you don't have them before day one of build season, you might find out those items get sold out in the first 10 hours of build season, depending on what they are. Uh, I can't remember what this last year's hot item was, but green wheels were something I think every team and their best friend wanted. So uh, things like that. You can never really predict, but uh, there are certain items that you know you're going to need. You're going to need gearboxes. You're going to need wheels. <laughs> You're going to need axles. You're going to need motors. You're going to need motor controllers, this, that, and the other. If you don't already have what you need for this coming season, now's the time to get it. Um, so this is just an overview. We're 
most teams and I, my team starts is where we go with week one. We're studying the game rules. We're giving prototypes created. Uh, never have I ever worked with a team that didn't have their drivetrain fully decided on by the first week. And if you can't do that, then you need to reevaluate why your drivetrain is taking you longer to build. And you want to typically have that drivetrain built that first week, if not in the first few days. Um, week two, got to continue and refine your prototypes. Uh, you should be getting a better idea of what your team's uh, prototypes are, which one's better versus another, and so you can better formulate your overarching strategy from that. Uh, CAD models usually sometimes start in week one, but CAD models are definitely starting by week two. And then uh, our team builds two robots, uh, and we typically build the start building the first prototype robot using the more efficient prototype uh, manipulators and end effectors starting week two. Uh, week three, we typically have some sort of a protobot completed if the game lends itself to being able to do that. Uh, week three, week four is typically our target for finishing our first robot uh, CAD model refinement. And then if you've discovered you've went too far into something that's wasting a lot of your time, you've got to consider about pivoting to what your next best strategy could be. And week three is typically by the time you need to be having that happen. If it happens later than that, you're going to be behind the curve, as I like to put it. Uh, and that's when manufacturing typically is starting for the final revision of the robot on our team. Uh, so week four, uh, we've got one group of people testing our version one robot with some obvious uh, additions and improvements. And then uh, typically our final, well, not really final, but our version two robot CAD model is probably completed by this point. And we're uh, wrapping up manufacturing of those uh, version two robot components. And about halfway through this week is when we decide that the software team needs to spend more time working on the version one robot than anyone else. So we want to make sure that our autonomous programs and our operator control software works without any issues. And this is the time to give them the, the opportunity. They should have, ideally, a, like a prototype drivetrain with some random components on it for them to learn with. But they want an actual relevant robot to work on by week four, is my opinion on the subject. Week five typically is when we've uh, started uh, assembly of the final or version two robot. Uh, we continue seeking improvements on our version one, and we're practicing typically a lot with our version one robot. I think this was, week five was the week we went up to the field up here over at the Johnson Center uh, to practice and see if we needed to change anything because we don't have the space for a full field in our shop as of right now, but um, that opportunity to get to play on a full-scale field taught us a lot about what we needed to be able to do. Um, and then by week six, the version two robot, the one that's going in the bag, is complete, and we're just practicing and we're bug fixing by then. This is what I call the ideal schedule. I will say there are certain years that this was thrown out the window, like 2017, for example. Everybody knows that shooting 40 balls into a bin in 15 seconds leads itself to being more complicated than other things. So uh, this is just what I try to, this is the target we try to shoot for. If we miss the target, it's not the end of the world. But this is where we aim for. So that's just my overall theory on build season. So let's get more into the cots. What cots items exist that can save you time? So obviously everybody knows about, yeah, more. cots. Ah, yeah, that's a good point. I should have said that first. So cots, who doesn't know what that stands for? Raise your hand. So there are a couple of people. Cots stand for commercial off-the-shelf components, okay? Um, those are things that you can buy typically instead of having to fabricate yourself, okay? And that's where these kind of items come in. Uh, most of you have seen at least once the kit of parts drivetrain that Andy Mark manufactures. Um, there are other alternatives. Uh, Vex produces a uh, kit frame system called VersaFrame. They also produce another one called uh, 
uh, drive in a day, which is an entirely separate uh, framing system. Uh, I don't believe 221 systems makes any FRC parts anymore. They used to, so that was going to be the alternative other option. But those are the, the two main companies, and we'll go over a little more details about drivetrains later. Uh, then you've got gearboxes. Uh, this is something that's changed a lot from back when FRC first started. FRC first started, you know, the drills that you love to use to put holes in everything? Well, actually, your drive motors for FRC used to be powered by those drill gearboxes and such. It's not a fun time, and the world you live in today is very different, and it's a lot better because of it. Uh, then you've got wheels, uh, intake kits, Anymark and West Coast products uh, has products in that area. Uh, gears and sprockets, uh, elevator kits, which have existed for a while now, but there's a lot of options there. And then you've got the actual, like, structure kits. Rev makes a variant of uh, build structures. Then you've got the VersaFrame from Vex. Everybody knows what 8020 is, I believe. Uh, Bosch makes their own version of something that looks like 8020 extrusion, which is um, metal profile, and then Annie Mark came out with, I believe two or three years ago, their own extrusion uh, material, which is called uh, Peanut. And uh, all these build structures are just uh, extruded aluminum that's a specific shape that they think is really useful for helping you build things easier. So there's a lot of options when it comes to that. <coughs> so. Why would you use COTS instead of custom fabrication for certain things? The first thing you got to do is definitely do a cost versus how much time you're going to save. If you're not actually going to save that much time by buying something, then make it yourself. <laughs> it depends on your resources. You've got to do a resource analysis on like what kind of tools do you have access to, what kind of funds do you have access to, and that will lead you to your conclusion about what you should and shouldn't be doing in terms of purchasing parts versus fabricating them yourself. Why are COTS awesome? Because you don't actually need advanced manufacturing tools to make them. Somebody else has those tools and can help you by producing the product for you. Um, and a lot of COTS items, if you're, if you're working with a team that's primarily made up of uh, students that have never done CAD design before, these are good design teaching tools. They, a lot of the COTS items that exist exist that have really great design cues. Uh, they're very variable. Uh, they're modular a lot of the times where they can have adjustability that when you're designing something for the first time, you may not have thought about things like that. And that's why these kinds of items are good to teach you uh, better design methods. Um, and like we said, save time. You build things faster. Uh, your prototypes typically come to fruition earlier, uh, and it, it makes your life easier. It's just the general theme of using a COTS component versus uh, manufacturing something from scratch, or another way of putting it, the <laughs> friends of mine pays, you don't have to uh, carve your own wheels <laughs> out of stone. Um, part standardization is something that uh, you may or may not know about is a huge benefit when you are building a robot. If a lot of your components are all using the same fasteners and the same uh, hole sizing, you end up with a lot easier time putting stuff together when it comes to the actual assembly process. So just an example of that is if you use the VEX VersaFrame uh, platform, all of the holes in that VersaFrame platform are number eight. And that means that you can use 832 bolts, you can use rivets and whatnot, and they're all going to be the same size. And when you want to put something together, you have a giant bucket of those fasteners of whatever size you need, and there's no searching for them because they're all going to be where you need. Stuff like that. And then this is another big selling point in terms of COTS versus uh, custom fabrication. A lot of you guys don't have the knowledge in... Uh, stress analysis of components when you design them. Hopefully you have a mentor that can help you learn about things like that. I'm not an expert at that. There are some very advanced pieces of software that exist to help you do that, but designing a component for durability through the course of a competition is a unique challenge that it's a bit out of reach for a lot of folks, and that's why when you're purchasing a component, you typically have that peace of mind knowing that what you're buying should be able to last you 
through an FRC season. And the ones that we purchased definitely did. We put 100 official matches, if you include the off season, on some of the parts on our robot, and none of them major failed at all except for plastic parts. So that's a big selling point as far as why COTS items are really intelligent. Uh, and they allow you to focus more time on other uh, objectives. You hear a lot in strategic design discussions about you need to be really good at a, a core section of the game's uh, features, whereas this past year's game, a lot of the game was built around manipulating the cubes, which were a very uh, simple uh, game piece compared to other gears. Uh, you can actually use COTS items to help you level up other parts of your robot by allowing you to spend more time on things that are more challenging. And that lends you into three more time resources. Uh, integration time. Integration is usually the most challenging part of building a robot. You can build your prototypes standalone and they work great by themselves. But when you need to put them all together on the robot, you need a certain amount of time to make sure that gets done and done well. And this gives you more time for that. It gives you more time for programming and it gives you more time for drive practice. And drive practice, how many times have any of you built a robot and only gotten a few days of drive practice? So it's not common, in, at least in the people in this room, but I can point out at least 20 other teams in Georgia that I could tell didn't have a whole lot of drive practice before their first event. So time. Time is obviously the resource that you're saving the most when it comes to COTS components. So let's talk about, again, some of the better ones that I know a lot of details about. So VersaFrame, it's a rectangular and box tubing profile based building system and you do not necessarily have to buy VEX's branded tubing. Uh, you can go buy box tubing and rectangular tubing from any metal supplier. It just may or may not have the hole pattern drilled into it. And you don't need that hole pattern necessarily to be pre-drilled in. Uh, you can actually, what we used to do on the team that I ran in Columbia is we would go to a printer and build and print out a strip of one-to-one uh, -one match of the face profile of the top of the tubing. So basically a one-inch strip, a really long piece with the hole pattern on it. And then we just tape that to the top of the piece of material and then we just go at it on the drill press. We just run the full line of holes onto it. It takes time but you end up with something that uh, has exactly what you need in terms of uh, holes where you want them. And you don't necessarily need to run the holes along the whole part unless you know for a fact you're going to need the holes in more than just the ends or the middle. Uh, lightweight. Uh, wood is very lightweight. Plastic is very lightweight. And the, the aluminum profile that uh, Vex Pro sells is extremely lightweight as well. Uh, and they have great integration with other COTS parts that VEX makes. Uh, and you don't have to have a whole lot of machining to knowledge to be able to use those parts. Uh, and another uh, product that VEX produces that uh, is something that if you haven't gotten a chance to play with it, I wish I had included a picture of it. Uh, they produce a unique profile of hex shaft which has rounded corners instead of sharp corners. And so what that allows you to do is instead of having to use hex bearings, which if you've ever had to purchase hex bearings or you ever had to uh, look for them, hex bearings are actually really expensive compared to their standard uh, circular counterparts. And you typically can't get hex bearings in the same quantity for the same price. So he Versa, Thunder Hex rather, allows you to use round bearings and it allows you to save a whole lot of money uh, and it saves you a whole lot of time in terms of uh, being able to put things together faster. <coughs> and then, last but not least, for those of you do, for don't have, that don't have a whole lot of CAD experience building things from scratch, every VEX component has a 3D model part online for you to take and be able to assemble together into components in your CAD systems without having any real prior CAD experience. So it's a great learning point for learning how to draw shapes and assemble components together in uh, 3D modeling spaces. <coughs> uh, 
And this is just a couple examples of what the VersaFrame system components look like. Uh, I don't have my mouse. Oh. So uh, over here, these flat plates here, they make them in a whole bunch of different angles. They've got 45 degree, 90 degree T pieces. Uh, they've got bearing blocks like you see uh, right here with allow for a lot of really easy mounting of like intakes and arms and such. Uh, you can see up here they've got a, a simulated gearbox to arm pivot point. Um, then they've got gearbox profiles which come from very sing simple single speeds to your more complex uh, multi-speed shifters. They've got dog shifting gearboxes and ball bearing shifting gearboxes, which we'll talk about that in just a little bit, what the difference between those are. Um, and, and all of these components that you see here are all things that VEX sells. This is VEX's variant of the kit of parts drivetrain, the VersaFrame drive. And these are things to help you get things going faster and to help you build things that you, you can trust will last you through the competition season. <clears throat> now, you guys live, like I said, in the gearbox golden age where you do not have to manufacture gearboxes yourself unless you're looking for a specific benefit that a gearbox that's sold doesn't uh, give you. And if you can give me a reason to build a custom gearbox right now, that would be surprising. Uh, there are very few reasons uh, to do so. Uh, there, there are some, but not many. Um, there are, like I said, single speed, two, three motor gearboxes. Uh, you even have gearboxes that just came out this past season allow you to drive things with 775 Pro motors. So you gotta do a lot of homework to make sure that you utilize them effectively or else they'll bite you, as I like to put it. Um, and like we said, uh, shifting gearboxes, um, ball shifters, there's a, uh, a shaft with a, small, a bunch of ball bearings and when there's a, uh, there's a locking pin inside the shaft, when the pin is pulled out, uh, certain gears are engaged and when the pin is pushed in, the ball bearings pop out of the shaft into these little slots and they engage a different set of gears. So that's just an alternative uh, method of allowing you to engage one gear set versus another using special grooves cut into the inside of the gear. Uh, and then dog shifting gearboxes are uh, built around this small triangular piece that locks into the side of a gear profile so that it'll let you switch between a higher gear and a lower gear set uh, based on what your needs are, uh, more power versus more speed. <clears throat> and those didn't exist back in the day either. That was a, that, that's a revelation in terms of uh, what you're allowed to do. Though um, what I've found, at least so far in the competitive seasons that I've spent, is that shifting is a luxury. You don't necessarily need to focus your time on that if you can improve something else about your robot first. And then we move away from more drivetrain gearboxes to your planetaries. These gearboxes allow you a lot of freedom in what you do for your end effectors, your intakes, your arms, your shooters, all these objects could be uh, effectively powered by uh, these planetary gearboxes, and there are a lot of options. Uh, my favorites currently are the Versa Planetary made by Vex Pro, and uh, Andy Mark's newest uh, series of gearboxes as well are very competitive. Um, the best things about the Versa Planetaries is that you have custom ability to change out your shafts and include integrated uh, encoder components. So you can change out your shaft profile to a hex shaft or a half inch shaft with a keyway. There's a whole bunch of options and that's what COTS items provide you is the choice of what you want versus what you need. And then another gearbox type that's not very common, uh, but it's useful in challenges like climbing. Um, it's called a power takeoff where you're allowed to power two different subsystems from the same gearbox and motors. Uh, you could have a elevator that's powered by your power takeoff gearbox in one gear, and then it, it engages a dog gear and pulls out to the other side, and then you're powering a winch to lift your robot up. So things like that are possible using a component that you can buy off the shelf as well. And then there's the new age components that have come out in the recent years, which 
are just different configurations of gearboxes that allow you to save space uh, and to use lighter weight components like plastics and belts and, and other customizable lengths and profiles of shafts. So you have so many options with gearboxes. I don't think anybody in Georgia really builds their own gearboxes at this point that I'm aware of, but if somebody does, quote me on it, I'm wrong. <laughs> Okay, so you're one of the only teams I've heard of in the state. Now, what benefits did you get out of it, do you think? Right, so yeah, there's stuff like that that has a very obvious benefit. Uh, which those are the kinds of cases where you could make something yourself if you had those resources to be able to do so. Uh, now, there are beyond drive gearboxes and beyond frames and drivetrain kits, uh, there are system specific uh, COTS components. Elevator kits are something that uh, a couple of teams I know uh, took a look at this year. Uh, Rev Robotics makes one, Andy Mark makes one, West Coast Products makes one. Uh, and VexPro makes one as well. I think they're separate design types. Um, then there are other uh, kits like intake kits. Uh, Andy Mark produces a really simple one and then uh, West Coast Products uh, just this past year came out with one as well, which I'll have a picture of that in a minute. Uh, then you've got climber kits like that power takeoff kit I talked about before called the Rocket Box. And then I think in this coming year, depending on what the game's gonna look like, you could see even more. Uh, you could see some different uh, arm style kits. Uh, if you study uh, old designs from first, uh, you may have heard this term thrown around from a team uh, down in Florida called uh, the pink team. There's a pink arm that exists, which is basically a uh, retractable, extendable arm that design that they came up with so that they could fit a robot arm inside of a smaller, lower profile and extend out to high places uh, really easily. And it's a very, very creative design. And if there was a commercial off the shelf option for that, you could see a whole lot of teams playing a whole different kind of game with that kind of a thing. And then shooters as well. Um, shooting is a really unique challenge because there's a lot of different ways to go about it. Uh, and maybe there are more uh, off the shelf options coming for that soon as well. You never know. <clears throat> So these are a couple of the intake kits that exist, at least at this point. Uh, the one on the right, actually, uh, a team that I worked with out in Appling used that in 2016, if you were still around back then, uh, for the Stronghold game, which involved a uh, gray boulder piece. It's about a little smaller than a soccer ball. Uh, and then the one on the right uh, is known as the Roller Claw Kit, which is a fully uh, uh, expandable, contractable uh, design that's good for manipulating things like the power cubes, like uh, inner tubes, uh, though you haven't had an inner tube game in a while, so you may or may not remember things like that, uh, and then balls as well. Uh, so these are two off-the-shelf component uh, styles, and what these allow you to do is they're so configurable and they're highly, uh, especially the one on the right, they're highly, uh, interchangeable that you, you can use them for all sorts of different uh, design cues to learn from and you can use them for all sorts of different games and you can choose how they work and they really only provide you with the metal components and the standoffs that allow the, them to sit as they uh, as you see in the picture you've got to decide what motors to put in it you've got to decide what chain and sprocket combination to use in it so it's not like they're just handing you the answer uh, you've got to solve some problems on your own to make sure that it works properly. <clears throat> and these are just, like I said, two examples of the robots that I've worked with that use those two types of intake kits. The one on the left uh, was the robot that 5632 built for Stronghold. You can see that intake there on the front with the mechanum wheels to help center the ball. And then on the right, though it's not the best picture of the intake itself, that's the, uh, the roller claw used to uh, hold on to the uh, cube. So uh, 
th that's just two examples of utilizing that component for one specific segment of the robot. And then elevator kits. Uh, the one on the right is the Animark, or I'm sorry, the one on the left is the Animark elevator kit. Uh, uses roller bearings along aluminum uh, square tubing. Uh, and it's a single stage uh, cast, or yeah, it's a single stage elevator in its base configuration. You can add more stages to it. Uh, that's just a single roller carriage in the center that rolls up and down. Uh, then you've got a whole bunch of options with linear actuators. That's something that uh, I don't think any teams in our area considered, but there are times and places where linear actuators can be useful. And then on the far right, that is a typical 80-20 style elevator using either like things like the Rev extrusion, the Bosch extrusion, 80-20, uh, where you've got uh, small roller wheels that allow your carriage to slide up and down in these little tracks on the side of the aluminum profile. So uh, you don't typically have alignment problems when using uh, that style of elevator, but what you do run into is those those pieces of material are typically bulkier, so you run into weight issues. So trade-offs, weight versus reliability, things to consider when you're designing your robot initially. <coughs> and then everybody knows that COTS electronics are your favorite thing. I don't think anybody designed their own custom electronics this year. If they did, please tell me now because I'd love to see it. I only worked with one team in the past uh, 10 years that built a custom electronic component. And it was very impressive, uh, but they would have been better served to spend some time building better mechanical components. Uh, there was a team that built a highly uh, custom control interface for the robot that took a lot of time to accomplish. And it was a very cool thing to do, but uh, it didn't provide a whole lot of benefit in the end. Um, but these are just examples of the COTS components you already know about potentially. Encoders, potentiometers, cameras. There's a couple of FRC specific ones. I believe there's a Pixie cam that's built specifically for FRC that's good for uh, vision tracking. And then just this past season, uh, the Limelight uh, camera came out, though that's fairly expensive. And I think in the coming years, there uh, could be an alternative that's not so expensive. Um, but at the same time, the ease of use with some of these devices can't be understated. Uh, with the limelight, I know in particular there's no real coding you have to do other than taking the output from the camera and using it in your autonomous program to determine your location versus the object you're tracking. So you don't actually have to do the whole uh, advanced algorithmic work that comes along with designing a uh, a vision tracking system at its basis. And vision tracking is a unique challenge in and of itself because of the fact that there are a lot of uh, efficiency variables that you have to keep in mind to make sure the system runs as quickly as possible. And so uh, stuff like that's just a good option to consider. Uh, then you've got your earth-based sensor t uh, types like your accelerometer, gyros. Um, the Navex and the Spartan board are two FRC specific versions that came out. Uh, the Navex is uh, currently, I think, one of the best options because they could give you a really low uh, cost option to use, and then there's a higher end option. Uh, but e either one is very nice. And then you've also got the analog, uh, the digital company. I can't remember the name of the brand, but uh, First Choice, which is your free options of parts, has that sensor in it. It plugs right into your Robo Rio, so. It's really nice, and you don't have to spend any money to get that. Then you've got other things like range finders, ultrasonic sensors, uh, LIDARs, which are becoming much cheaper. Uh, <clears throat> bump switches, if you don't use bump switches, I highly recommend thinking about them because bump switches can save you in a lot of ways. Um, I guarantee you if our team didn't use bump switches, our elevator would have shot out the top just like 1746s did. Uh, bump switches saved the day. Uh, Light and color sensors are a really big important thing. Uh, and then magnetic sensors, that's something that you don't find in a whole lot of places, but it's very good for detecting the state of pneumatic cylinders, whether extended or retracted. Um, so that's just another option. They're typically also called reed switches is what you'll find them listed as online at different parts stores. <coughs> 
So these are just a couple of rules I want to share that are kind of, they, go, they coincide with COTS design development. And these are two of the golden rules that uh, the former head mentor of 1114 shares. Uh, and those are always build within your team's limits. Evaluate your abilities and resources honestly, realistically. Your limits are obviously defined by your manpower, your budget, and your experience. You don't necessarily need to build anything that's extremely complex. But as you get more experience, which it seems like a lot of you in the room are, you can obviously push boundaries within reason as well. And then this is my golden rule <laughs> as well, and that is if you have 30 units of robot and the functions have a maximum of 10 units, it's better to have three units of your robot that are extremely high functioning at 10 out of 10 instead of five parts of your robot that only kind of work at five, six out of 10. So making sure you're extremely strong at a core group of things versus being only okay at everything is really important. So I've given you a lot of just like general information about COTS parts. Where do you start with trying to make a decision on what you want to get and what you uh, want to make yourself? You've obviously got to start with considering your game mechanics and your game pieces and then you gotta do your research. COTS parts exist not only from FRC suppliers like Andy Mark Vex, West Coast and Rev, they exist from uh, industrial suppliers as well. Uh, you've got things like McMaster Car and Granger. You've got companies like Automation Direct uh, who provide you with awesome uh, industrial automation components. Uh, there's a whole host of others. Um, Bosch is another one to look into. Uh, I'm not just saying that because I used to work there either. Uh, they have a lot of great uh, components that uh, can make your robot building experience a lot easier. And, and do research on what kinds of uh, robot and uh, automation examples exist in industry. Um, that can teach you a lot if there isn't already a pre-existing design that's been executed before in FRC. Uh, an example of that would be last season, 2017, um, there were a couple of teams that came up with a really uh, unique way to take the balls from their hopper bin and feed them into their shooter in a single line. And they used inspiration from a paintball gun's indexer to be able to uh, feed the balls in just like a paintball gun does into one straight line. So things like that are really useful for uh, designing things for the first time and you didn't have to come up with it yourself <laughs> necessarily. Um, and then consider your resources like we've said several times now. If you have the resources to make something yourself quicker than you can buy it, then do it. But if you know that you're going to save a serious amount of time, consider what you could purchase that helps you save that time. And then we come to the integration step. So like we said, system integration is by far one of the most challenging parts of engineering design. And the utilization of COTS makes that easier. Most of the good COTS components that you and I have used over the years have design features that make it easier to integrate things. The claw that we purchased this year had hull patterns run along the entire back side of it so that you could mount it however way you'd like. Same thing with the intake kit from uh, Andy Mark. There were a, a huge number of hull options for mounting it onto different uh, materials. Um, your mounting uh, points for gearboxes have been seriously thought out about making it extremely easy so that you don't even have to think about how to integrate them in, okay? So stuff like that is extremely easy when it comes to building things with COTS parts usually. I will say the only thing that is more difficult is integrating VersaPlanetary gearboxes without, uh, without purchasing VersaPlanetary like uh, gearbox holders and such can be a little bit of a pain. Uh, but if you have the access to the CAD files like they provide you, you can take the whole profile that they uh, have on the side of the gearbox and you can reflect that onto parts of your robot if you're going to do some advanced machining. If you're not, 
they sell mount pieces that help that make that process easier for you. And this is my last preaching point above all else. Please give your, your team members as much drive time as possible. Uh, most people that I talked to this past year were extremely impressed with why our driver was showing out as much as he was, and that's because we gave him practically two weeks of drive practice before our first competition. Like two full weeks of like, here, come into the shop and drive the robot as much as you can. So stuff like that is extremely important if you want to be strong with driver control, is getting your hands on the controls. It doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to choose a person who's good at video games to be your driver. You, you want to choose someone who's extremely dedicated and has the time uh, to put in to getting familiar with the controls. That's, that's the key that I've seen over the past couple of years. <coughs> and uh, here's a couple of links. Uh, for those of you who want to take a look at the components that are FRC specific, these are the suppliers that I've used and are very familiar with. Antimark, Vexpro, Armabot's one of the ones that uh, builds some really good uh, components. West Coast, Rev, and uh, Robot Shop sells a huge variety of robot components, not just FRC specific, but uh, it's another place to take a look. <coughs> With that, I'm going to leave it open to everyone for questions. Yeah. You talked a lot about how potentially purchasing things and kind of making your own time mm -hmm. and doing your own drive practice. Were there things you said for even if you don't have a specific application built that you would like to like see your team try and do something or is there kind of a list that you would like to purchase? Right. So, uh, tech, so purchasing something to learn how it works is what you meant? Right. So if you have the capability to learn, uh, if you have the capability to design things uh, from the ground up, it's definitely a, a learning experience. Um, and typically we don't purchase uh, COTS components during the off season because that's the best time uh, to take the time to learn and design new things uh, from scratch. Uh, there's definitely a, a, a huge benefit to designing something uh, for yourself and learning about what can fail and go wrong in that process and what you can do better. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a really good thing to do. It's just you've got to make sure you find the right time to do it. Um, it's just choices, trade-offs, stuff to think about. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, um, so this past season, actually, um, for those of you who remember, uh, we started out the season with a vacuum. Uh, and uh, the vacuum design required the attention of, and that vacuum was entirely uh, custom designed with the exception of the housings that the vacuum like um, turbines came in. The turbines themselves were actually purchased, um, which was our initial point. Uh, we wanted to upgrade that vacuum and continue using it, so we went for the fully custom, never been touched like this before design with our strongest design students all in on that design. And then we had to have an alternative option because of the fact that we saw how things had not gone right. So we had a choice to make, do what we could to make sure that the vacuum design had all the possibility of success that we could, and then also at the same time making sure we have a solid backup plan. So we didn't necessarily have to choose one versus the other, but we made sure we put enough resources, our strongest resources, into trying to build something from scratch. And at the same time, we also knew that we needed a backup option, and we couldn't, we didn't have the right design resources available to design something from scratch with that group. So that's an example of what we had to do this past season. <laughs> and it turned out that our uh, custom manufactured vacuum system blew up when we first tried to use it, quite literally. Uh, uh, that's, the shop smoked up pretty bad <laughs> because we designed a certain system to run uh, with the motor's peak power in mind instead of uh, just their regular output. And so we ended up blowing up motors pretty bad. <laughs> but we learned a lot from it. and. Uh, 
over the past two months, we actually re went back to the drawing board and spent the time to uh, continue to improve that. And we do have a vacuum that works. It's just it never saw the light of a robot necessarily to compete with. So we do have something that if there was another game that vacuum lended itself towards, you might see it because <laughs> it's there. <laughs> I promise you that. Right, so uh, that's one of the things I was saying about uh, with the VersaFrame system, it allows you to build things faster prototyping wise because you have the different hole options per se. You don't have to necessarily just randomly pick a hole. You have variability. Um, you can mount things a certain way and if it doesn't work, you can just slide something one hole over and try it again. So variability uh, is a huge benefit in COTS components that Yes, you could technically just re-drill a hole <laughs> just willy-nilly on your uh, prototypes components, but uh, you end up with a little bit more controllable uh, precision with COTS components. So uh, that's something that we found uh, in, through practice that we get better test results using COTS components than we did by just randomly drilling holes and trying it again. <laughs> Sometimes you got to and sometimes you don't. That's that's what we found. Um, yeah, I would start, I always start with drivetrains typically because drivetrains have some pretty uh, standard uh, design cues. Uh, so, um, if you're starting out with the Andy Mark drive kits, which are plate-based, uh, you can then turn around and design your own plate-based system uh, using CAD. And you've got to make sure that you have a strong foundation in CAD. That's the place to start. Uh, if you don't have a strong foundation in CAD, designing custom parts yourself is a very challenging thing to do. So that's the first place to go. And there are a lot of online resources for learning CAD. Um, for those of you who may or may not have heard of it, there is a uh, conglomerate of resources, a collection of resources rather, uh, on a website called the Compass Alliance. Uh, a couple of Georgia teams I think contribute to it as well. And, and there are great resources through that uh, that can help you learn CAD if you're not necessarily in a CAD class right now in school. Uh, so start out by getting some good foundational knowledge in CAD and then try designing your own drivetrain. See what matters when it comes to spacing wheels out versus what chain lengths you might need to use or belts because there are different things you have to consider with uh, the mathematics behind the lengths of chain versus the lengths of belt and the pulleys you use versus the sprocket teeth count you use and there are a lot of uh, learning uh, opportunities there uh, and then you can move up from designing just base drivetrain components to gearboxes because I think gearboxes are a really useful uh, thing to learn about if you want to become a mechanical engineer, um, there's a whole lot of mathematics behind uh, designing a gearbox and the output ratios. And then there's these different uh, components of uh, teeth profiles that are pretty uh, interesting to learn about. So gearboxes are what I think are like the second thing you could try learning to build. Uh, and that's actually what I started out with. I started out with drivetrain design and then I moved on to gearboxes. Uh, and then I found that designing intake components like that roller cloth for a cube uh, is a really good uh, place to go as well. Um, you, you can take a lot of hints from this past year's designs and make something uh, a lot better yourself. Um, and a lot of the students on my team did that too. We bought that roller cloth kit online, but we have like six other roller claw designs in our design channel now that we could go and make and not have to buy one again next year. So buying these components offers a lot of potential inspiration to making stuff yourself later because you've learned certain design cues like standoffs, using standoffs between plate metals to allow you to mount uh, gears and sprockets and wheels in between them, stuff like that. Standoff design is something that a lot of sheet metal teams know about, but uh, teams that have been just Home Depoting it up 
might not have known that. So stuff like that. A uh, couple. Um, uh, 4451 in South Carolina, they use uh, heavily COTS components with the VEX Pro build system. Uh, so you can take a look at theirs. Uh, I want to say that uh, another team would be 1648 G3 does a whole lot with the VersaFrame system and COTS components uh, to an extent. Um, i trying to think who else. I don't remember if 4468 did off the top of my head either, but there's there's a whole lot of uh, I can't think of team members that's something that I I should have done a little more homework on but yeah those are just a couple that I know of for sure because I saw them recently but um, and every so here's something I didn't put in our presentation but for the most part 1102 has four primary tools we have drill presses we have bandsaw we have chop saw and we have a sander we do not have a CNC router, a CNC mill, a CNC uh, water jet, any of those tools. That robot that we built that did so well this year was entirely built by those hand tools and utilizing a different variation of COTS parts. We used VersaFrame for the drive chassis. We used the uh, plastic uh, slides that you get in your kit apart, the little clip slides. Uh, I guess rails is what they're called. We used those for the elevator. Uh, you saw the intake system that we ended up with. We, we built a custom intake. We started without, we started trying to build the cust intake custom with the vacuum, but then we moved to something that tested better. Um, our climbing system, with the exception of the hook deployment, was uh, VEX Pro gearbox is mounted on a rail of uh, Versa frame. Um, so 80% or more of our robot was all COTS integrated components. Uh, An integration in itself is a pretty uh, fun design challenge. Because if we didn't integrate those parts together very well, we wouldn't have had a good robot in the end. Anybody got anything for me? Yeah. So we have a. Uh, a spreadsheet that we keep track of all of our costs um, and so whenever we want to make uh, an order we typically have a giant master order list uh, or not order list but a master like record uh, and we keep everything in there we don't necessarily use any like business accounting software so mainly it's just a giant spreadsheet which it's all right it's not the most professional like business oriented way of doing it but we didn't lose track of anything doing it that way uh, yeah we have its own we have our own column for cots orders that we made through the yeah no that's that's pretty much what we did um, and it lent itself fairly well to making sure we had track of everything Anything? No? All righty then. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, John. <laughs> uh, like I said earlier, we are the Robo Jackets. This is John Fogarty. I'm Sarah Storer, and we will have TE next weekend. And next weekend, I think, is a strategy, either that or computer science, but this weekend was our mechanical design track, and uh, thank you guys for coming. If you have any questions, uh, his contact information was on one of the first slides, and we will be putting those out on the RoboJackets website as soon as possible. So yeah, thanks. <laughs>